Hey everybody, it's Joe Keith from DOA. How you doing? And I want to plug you into, if you haven't already, to records in my life. Joey Keithley, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure, yeah. Tell us, can you give us a bit of what's been going on lately with yourself and DOA? Yeah, DOA's got a new uh, album out called Fight Back uh, on my record label, Sudden Death Records, uh, which you can find at suddendeath.com. And uh, we've been on a few, uh, one big tour of the U.S. already, uh, another one coming up, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it's going pretty well. Let's go back. He's, DOA is, is synonymous with uh, punk fans. I mean, it goes, yeah. it goes back a long, long time. What are Give us a couple of albums growing up, um, maybe one that you got into playing punk. Cause yeah, the early ones. I mean, um, I would say probably the first record, uh, first two records that uh, we got collectively because we were like, wanted to be musicians and we were like terrible <laughs> and we had no idea what we were doing. We had a band called Stone Crazy <laughs> which was terrible. We covered Led Zeppelin and Steve Miller and stuff like that, right? It was awful. And uh, then our drummer, Dimwit, he bought home the, the Ramones first record, which we had been hearing about. And we put it on and went like, wow, every song sounds the same, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, they, we didn't realize the subtleties of punk rock at that point, right? So that was kind of the first one. So we started learning some songs off that. And... Uh, the other really great one, I mean, obviously we heard the singles from the Pistols and the Clash and we're going, wow, these bands are fantastic. Uh, the other great one was the, the Dams first record, Dam, 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 which is still to this day one of my three or four uh, favorite records. And uh, we listened to that. Okay, that's how you play punk rock, right? And, you know, because the people in Vancouver, had, we'd seen a little bit on TV, but these records stood, stood out and it showed us a lot about how to play. Was there another record like in your team? I know you just said the Dan, but was there another record where you sat down and, and said to myself, you know what? Oh, I want to learn this. Like, I want to learn this record. Like, I want to put on the headphones and. and yeah. Uh, well, there's actually have a bit of a funny story about that because I, I wasn't a guitar player until I was 18 or I was a drummer till then, right? And um, so <clears throat> up in my bedroom in my uh, suburban house in Burnaby, uh, uh, I had my drum set. I saved all the money from my paper route, right? And. Uh, uh, so I wanted to learn uh, how to play the Hawaii Five O theme because I had bought the single, right? <laughs> That's great. So you're talking like this is 1968 or something like that. I was probably about 12, and uh, and I had the intro in there, and dun, 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 dun. I'd be playing along. But our record player was one of those ones where you had uh, the the top flipped up, and just had a little speaker like maybe about two inches across. And of course, as soon as the intro was done. <laughs> I started drumming. I couldn't hear a damn thing. <laughs> so I went off time every time, which is maybe what eventually uh, put my path in towards guitar playing, not being a professional <laughs> drummer, right? So I couldn't stay on time with the Hawaii Five O theme, right? So that was the kind of first little single I had. And it's like, and I loved drumming. And uh, uh, my mom had jazz records. So I kind of really got into that, like Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller and stuff like that. That kind of, because they had like superb, superb drummers, right? So I really liked that. And, but I think the one seminal rock record uh, that I got, uh, which I, um, my mother hated, was uh, Killer by Alice Cooper. Hmm. I think that's the one where he hangs himself, hmm. right? So I got the record, and I was about 13, and my mother looked at the cover of this and then opened it up, and he's hanging himself inside the cover. And so that record went out the door, and then I tried to go to the Alice Cooper concert, and she wouldn't let me go to the Alice Cooper concert. <laughs> that guy hangs himself. Right? <laughs> like, it's a stage thing, Mom. <laughs> right? You know, the, she didn't get that, right? Yeah. Well, it was probably shocking at the time, right? Oh, because yeah. We were like, I, I, no, he set the template for um, he studied carnivals and whatever, and the, a lot of people had taken that whole... Um, Stick at being outrageous. I mean, punk rock did too, right? Obviously, took a cue from uh, show, showmen and show women of the past. 
And what what punk rock? I mean, the whole show's not about punk rock, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But what punk rock album changed everything? In your in your opinion, what album would you say? Well, I think the one that's like I I really think uh, Never Mind the Bullets that like yeah. that really kind of defined uh, the sound and the approach to the guitar playing and the drumming. Um, I saw Paul Cook uh, at the Rebellion Festival a couple years ago playing with the Professionals. I was like. I was blown away how good he was. He was like 64 years old or 65. I was like, wow. And that guy was a big definer of our drum sound, like Chuck Biscuits, our drummer. He just took ideas from Paul Cook and just embellished them. And all these accents that you hear there are like all over every DOA record, just stolen from the Sex Pistols, of course, right? So um, so that was a, a great record. It was also like angry and political, and which is like really kind of drew me into it because I like kind of had got into politics a little bit like when I was in high school like there was a big Greenpeace protests uh, they had organized high school students to leave school and march around the US uh, consulate in downtown Vancouver right and of course when we left our school in Burnaby North um, our the principal came out and physically held his arms out and tried to block 300 students from going on this uh, protest uh, <laughs> against arms proliferation by the US Army right and uh uh, of course, we all just laughed and thumbed our nose at him and that kind of thing, right? And um, but the, but the politics of that, I kind of got into that really early when I was about sixteen or seventeen. And then when the sex whistles came along, I was going like, "Wow, this is really political." You know, people were trying to be beating up Johnny Rotten. Uh, they had songs "God Save the Queen," they're critical of the Queen. And I'm going like, it was really kind of amazing because I had kind of grown grown up with. Uh, um, late 60s kind of hippie music uh you know but a lot of it was like you know was really anti-war stuff anti-vietnam war so i had that kind of sentiment when i was like 14 or 15 and then later on the sex pistols went like okay you know f the hippies cut off your hair and uh you know uh this is this is punk rock you know f you type thing right so it was like uh, it was pretty amazing and they made a worldwide name out of it right Sure, sure. I mean, they needed to make like the the Sex Pistols were that they needed to make that statement because I think they were in kind of that hippie music a little bit. Like they they cite Pink Floyd as, as huge influences, yeah, and right. Prog rock bands, but you know the status quo was not like in England at the time, right? It was just like I guess that that was their statement, right? Like cutting off their hair and, and as much yeah, as they but, made fun of those bands, they they were into them. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, because I mean, well, you had to make a break somewhere. When I got into punk rock. Uh, uh, they used because I, I grew up on the on this uh, small mountain called Burning Mountain, not really much of a mountain, about thousand feet high. But there was this guy who had money he bought singles. My brother told me about when he when the new single he bought a new seven inch record. You're talking like 1966 or something like that. When it wasn't a hit anymore, he'd take the seven inch record and he'd roll it down the hill, down the mountain, down the main <laughs> road. And of course, my brother and his friends go like, "Oh, it's a, this was a hit last week. We should listen to this, right?" So and I That's always incredible. remember that story. So when I got into punk rock. I found a, some sort of hill or like downward slope somewhere in Vancouver's living. I took all my old Led Zeppelin records and rolled them down the hill as my statement, like I'm not into this rock anymore, right? Yeah, so my deep purple records and all that kind of stuff, right? So I got rid of them, right? That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, let, let's just touch a bit more on the political scene. I mean, yeah. it's been, it's been. I mean, now we're living in, you know, kind of ugly times, not nice, mm -hmm. pleasant times. And, and people, yes. like I said, people in writing for a long time, like Bruce, Bruce Springsteen and you yeah. know, Hendrix and The Clash, like Joe Strummer. What's a, what's a good record to, I don't think we'll ever, between you and I and whoever, whoever I insult, we're, insult, we're not going to be able to awake like, like a yeah. lot of politicians, but what, what's. I, I think a message. Uh, maybe something like uh, Struggle by Woody Guthrie. You know, something like that, which is maybe not everybody's cup of tea, but the words uh, that were written in the uh, 30s and 40s are really true today. You know, and I, I think that you got to look at that and uh, and not get down. I think people have to look, look at what's going on, not get down about the situation, because it's not great. We have like, a, uh, you have people that are, pseudo fascists or or fascists taking power in a lot of countries or there's like right wing uh racist movements uh, all over europe uh like in the netherlands in uh in in austria in england in france um the the leaders of uh elected leaders of poland and hungary are basically fascists we have donald trump in the united states you have and he's managed to embolden like uh uh 
racist, right? And uh, I said to somebody the other day, I said, can you believe that in 2018 that we would be talking about the Ku Klux Klan? And I, my friend said, no. I said, yeah, I can't believe it either. I thought they were like so long dead and disgraced. I mean, they hadn't disappeared. There's still people who believed in it, obviously, right? But they, they were like so uh, out of touch and not in the forefront in mainstream society. But now they're kind of back up there. You know, and it's just like, wow. And they're being allowed to march and stuff like that rather than just like, whereas before, I don't know, five years ago even, people were just going like, yeah, this, you guys are full of crap and nobody would listen to them. Yeah, so it's it's strange time we're in. Yeah, let's let's lighten the moment. And, sure, and, and have please, a bit please. fun. <laughs> no, you got to laugh, right? Because that's the yeah, most, yeah. Positivity is always the best. Yeah, like you said, it's the only way to to. Care. I know you're a family man, yeah. and I, I don't know if you've seen the movie School of Rock with uh, if you're familiar with it, but the concept. But yes, if you had a class, if you were got a job teaching tomorrow, and you're a music teacher, and you had to send the home kids with one record that they could learn to play from or, or be inspired to play. Which which record? Wow, okay. Uh, good call. Like, for something all around. Uh, maybe, like, uh, like, Beggar's Banquet or, like, uh, Rolling Stone. One of those really, not early and not later, but the um, 68 to 72 golden era of the Rolling Stones because they had that snotty punk rock type attitude right. they really told the world what they thought and it it has a really dirty greasy playing on it right those are i'd say you could learn a lot from that uh, any of those records excellent excellent yeah. and last one what what is your idea of a flawless record um i just bought a copy a, a gatefold copy the other day is probably one of my top five in fact i say it's top five because uh, i went to jamaica when i was a kid my brother was a teacher down there so we went to visit him and uh i happened to, to fall in love with the soundtrack for the harder they come so the, to me that is like a, you can learn a lot from that and it's just wonderful to listen to and i was in a record store the other day and i bought myself another copy and i went like yeah. That's nice. a pretty nice shape for seven bucks. Nice. Jimmy Cliff had the bit. The harder they, come, the harder. The harder they come. Yeah. He was the lead guy. He put the lead guy in the movie. He sa he sang that song, which was like the hit off that song. But there's all sorts of that's like, great pre too, pressure, like pressure drop, pressure we'll drop, say, right? Which is one of the one of the classic ones that the, the Clash did, right? Which um, right, right, yeah. That's another amazing. I don't want to get too far off topic, but how yeah. how reggae like influenced punk. I mean, it's yeah. all the, the lines are right there into all and all the music. Yeah, I think it's really great. I mean, another record I really love is like the Specials' first record, right? And definitely, this was the same scene, uh, punk rock uh, mixing with ska and uh, uh, you know um, and reggae, and it's like a really like an amazing thing the way it grew. I, I, Sadly, now, if you go to a punk rock show, you really don't hear much of that anymore. Right. But we used to do shows in the old days where we'd have a reggae band, have DOA, and then we'd have like a, an experimental new wave band. Because I guess because for all the miscreants and all the people, <laughs> <laughs> all of us miscreants and people that weren't following normal society rules, we all gathered in one place. And there was only about 50 or 60 of us in Vancouver. And we went to every show and every band was interesting. Didn't, you didn't have to be fast and loud like DOA or the subhumans, right? You, you could, uh, you know, do something different. That's great. Thank you very much. I'd like yeah. to ask you any words of wisdom. Yeah. Um, talk minus action equals zero. That's my motto. Thank you so much.